Abbey Road Studios is perhaps the world's most iconic recording complex, and it's also home to one of the most impressive microphone collections. This time, Grammy-winning engineer Sylvia Massey interviews Lester Smith, the custodian of the collection for almost 50 years, and gets the story behind some of the collection's most interesting and historic pieces. Lester Smith, we're here with you at Abbey Road Studios, the world-famous Abbey Road Studios. Yeah. You started here, when did you start working In January here? 1970. In 1970, and were you always a, an engineer, or what, what well, did you start? Well, I started work at Hayes, EMI at Hayes, because I had a great passion for tape recording, mm -hmm. and on the technical side of tapes, machines. So I got a job in their tape record department looking after their BTR2 tape machines. They are the um, designed and built by EMI and they were the first commercial large tape machines that the uh, BBC also used. Well, you're known as the, uh, the expert on microphones at Abbey Road. So how did you make the transition from tape mm. and engineering mm. into the technical world of microphones. Well, I don't know if my boss at Tape Records liked me or not, but he told me there was a job going at Abbey Road Studios in London to be assistant to Mr. Len Page, who was the senior engineer who was looking after all the disc cutting equipment. Mm. So I applied for the job and started in January 1970 and I was looking after, along with Len Page, six cutting rooms, cutting vinyl discs. And uh, it was only two years in 72 that uh, they decided to form a new technical division at Abbey Road to look after, and I was given the choice of looking after tape machines or microphones. Mm -hmm. And obviously I chose microphones because it was something I'd never touched or knew anything about. And I thought, this is like an adventure, start from the beginning. Well, there was quite a, a collection already here at Abbey Road when you started then. Yes, over 500 microphones at least, and uh, it's grown substantially since then mm. to over 800 today. 800. And so what is your role here now? Well, there's several. Um, looking after the microphones is primarily my major role, but uh, I'm still associated with the vinyl cutting lathes. Mm. And um, we thought that had gone forever when CDs appeared on the scene. And sure enough, uh, most factories closed down because no more vinyl, mm. but then it's all bounced back. And that's quite an amazing achievement. achievement. So you, you are known as perhaps the custodian of the microphone collection here at Abbey Road and keeping the yes. mics in operating yes. uh, condition. So, uh, and how do you do that? Is it, are you working on mics every day? Pretty well. Every time a problem occurs, the runners and the sound engineers will put a few microphones on my desk and say, this doesn't work or this sounds thin or this has got a noise on it. And having so many valve microphones, you do tend to get noises quite a lot that shouldn't be there. When you test these mics, I heard there is something called a noise gun. Is that something that you use? Well, I need to know the output from every mic we have. And I've got a stock book that I built up over the years with all the characteristics and the outputs of every microphone all serialized numbers and uh, with a result against each one. And every time I've had to repair a microphone, it gets noted in my book. And we use this noise gun as a standard means of measurement. And shall I uh, show? Yes, please. Show us the uh, noise gun and, uh, and your record keeping, if you could. Well, the noise gun looks like this. There's only three in the world that was designed oh. and made. I won't point don't, at you. Don't point it at me. Um, and I've got all three. And what they do, it produces white noise from the loudspeaker mm -hmm. in front. I've got a set distance of about 10 inches away from the centre of the di diaphragm of the microphone. I've got a phone meter which measures the noise, the output sound. And when it's set to there, <coughs> 
I get a reading on an external meter of how many millivolts is coming from that microphone. So there, then I know that the levels are correct or not. Interesting. And then you document this in, in your record. The microphone book that I started in 1972, when we uh, took over this uh, job of technical job of looking after microphones, um, it was a matter of I had no one to teach me. There was no one who passed on information. I learnt it all from the beginning by taking uh, examples of good microphones and working from there. Mm -hmm. And uh, every microphone uh, is in here. It doesn't look very exciting, uh, but I've got pictures of the micro type of microphones and the little diagram showing how. There's the STC 4038. Yes. There's an RCA 44. BX yes. ribbon. Yes, I see. Uh, for just for example, with all the uh, serial numbers and whatever I did that day, it's good keeping records. Then no you know doubt. what happened last time, or is it happening again? Mm -hmm. You just keep on top of everything. In the Abbey Road collection, I think there's probably some very uh, interesting and uh, historic mics. We have. We're yeah. very proud of our collection. We'd like to talk about some of those. Yes. In particular, um, tell us about the AKG D19s in the collection. We have quite a few of those. They, they look like this. And it's a AKG D19, which was used as sometimes uh, on Ringo's drums, mm -hmm. as a hi-hat, and sometimes as a talkback microphone from the control room and um, it's fairly universal microphone. We like it because it is one of the better sounding dynamic microphones. Unfortunately it's very fragile. The uh, coil producing the sound is less than is about one thousandth of an inch in diameter which means that if it's dropped it can shatter the uh, wire and it, it becomes uh, no use. Unfortunately, um, we have lost an awful lot that way by careless um, dropping on the floor. How many did you originally we have? We had over 30. Oh. We've got a couple. <laughs> We've still got a couple left. And can they be repaired? Unfortunately, uh, well, we, we really wanted AKG. To, uh, uh, 40 years ago, we wanted them to carry on making but they wanted to produce new models mm. which aren't quite so good and they're extremely difficult to repair because the wire I'm talking about is so fine thinner than a hair thinner than a human hair yeah to try and join up oh goodness new to old mm. uh, talking more about AKG mics we have a, a D30 here can you tell us about this mic when I started in the uh, 70s, we had quite a few D20 microphones by AKG. And that, and they looked uh, similar to this, but only half the size because it was only a s single microphone. This D30 is quite a rarity. I don't think anyone else has got um, a, a, any number of these at all. We have two, which were, um, inherited from Olympic Studios and that they are equivalent to two D20s back to back. So that gave you the, the advantage of a figure of eight. I see, so it's a selectable pattern. It's a selectable pattern top and bottom here. I see. Um, the bottom is the pattern and the top is a base cut which is common to all the D20s. The D20 also is very like a D12, but um, slightly, slightly earlier than a D12. And uh, would you say that these mics have been used on uh, some famous sessions? Well, from Olympic Studios, they came and that's where Jimi Hendrix and all the uh, Rolling Stones were. So, so we're mm. saying that Jimi Hendrix played on this uh, into uh, So this I'm mic. told by the people who worked at Olympic and they should know. 
and Derek Clapton also. They were they all love this microphone. I say this microphone. We've got two, so. Well, you could have had uh, Eric Clapton play in mm, one mm, and mm, Jimi mm. Hendrix play in the other, but I'd say that that was a very important mic. Yes, indeed. Wow. Let's uh, talk about some other microphones. The uh, EMI ribbon mics, the RM1B. Yeah, that's a favorite of mine. Yeah. I have one here. It's all a bit tied up with string because they suspend it like so. Or it can go on a stand, like so. And it says on the front of it, EMI Research Laboratories Microphone Type RM1B number 34. I understand we only built 35 of them. And we have two here, which is ideal for stereo, of course. And we have used it on many, many film um, jobs we have because uh, it gives a coloration. If you're doing a film, there's lots of sequences that are set in the past mm. and it adds a little bit of character to the film quality. So it has a quality. very vintage quality. It does, yes. Uh -huh. And so you do allow people to use these? Oh yes, yes. There's nothing here that is not used at our studios. Oh goodness. And anybody who hires the studios can choose whatever microphones they like. Fantastic. So let's talk about some other ribbon mics. There, there's a um, an STC forty thirty eight ribbon mic. Yes, and I believe those were developed with the BBC. Is that right? The BBC designed it, and it was produced in the late forties. Uh, um, STC Standard Tape Standard Telephone and Cable Company built them for the BBC. Uh, this is very important because, in my view. These were on sale for about 17, 18 pounds back then. Mm -hmm. Our RM1B, which I just spoken about, that was being manufactured in a factory and cost a lot of money to make individually each one. And I think we only built 35 because this appeared commercially and EMI said, we can't afford to build our own mics, let's buy them from uh, STC mm -hmm. and save a lot of money. So we went over um, to these and we uh, have about 30 or so today. But STC stopped building mics, is that right? Yeah, they stopped uh, about 40 years ago now and uh, or a bit longer and Coles decided to take over all their equipment and carry on manufacturing the ribbon microphone. And they're still being and built And it's today. very, very popular. It's a very good microphone. I recommend it to everybody and anybody. <laughs> What's the difference between the 4038 and the 4033, Mike? This one, again, wasn't so much a Abbey Road microphone, but we did um, inherit quite a few from Olympic. I believe there are a few Beatles sessions who did use this type of microphone. The difference is it is a combined made by a standard telephone company, but it's a combined ribbon and dynamic microphone in the same housing. And from a little switch on the back, you can have just the pressure mic, the ribbon mic, or a combination ah. of the two. So I'd like to ask you about the U47s in the collection. They're, yes. they're built by Neumann uh, and uh, one has a Neumann tag on it and one has a Telefunken tag. Yes. And in fact they're different from each other. They're not both U47s, are they? The larger one is a 47 mm -hmm. and the Telefunken is a 48. The Telefunken label doesn't mean they built it. They were a big electrical company in Germany and Neumann let them put their label on a few of the 48s, but we have 48s that have got the Neumann label. I just happened to grab this one for the interview. So the 48, though, uh, also is selectable f for a uh, cardioid pattern, is that right? They're both selectable for cardioid, yes. So we generally call them 47s, put out a 47, doesn't matter which one we use. Mm -hmm. The difference comes with the 48, it does have a, a figure of eight. Uh, option. 
it's only got the two options and the 47 also only had two options a, the figure of sorry the cardioid and the omni and when the 47 became um, was designed in the late 40s and it was commercially available by 1950 particularly in America and Britain and we bought most of our 47s and 48s during the early 50s and when Neumann produced the 48 which was actually six years after the 47 they sold it with um, one 48 in and the head of the 47 in the box so you could take the head off and put the 47 head onto the 48 body and it would work as Omni so oh. that was something you didn't know I didn't know that at all so that was useful okay <laughs> and these microphones though you see them on every pop photograph including the Beatles that come out that were to Abbey Road, they're still every day in use today. They're still used all the time. And one of our favourite sounding microphones. In fact, we've got modern versions. We've got Browner, we've got uh, Geffel microphones, but these will always come out on top, in our opinion. How many 47s are in the collection? 47 slash 48? We've got 25. 25? Yes. And have they been in the collection for... Always. Uh, always? Yes. So you could say that these were used on the Beatles records? Definitely, yes. Fantastic. Lester, I'd like to ask you about this microphone. Oh, this is one of my favorites. This is a moving coil or dynamic microphone. But uh, my hero is Alan Blumlein because he was a genius and he designed this microphone and his uh, Holman uh, was the engineer who built it. So you need a genius designer who can put uh, mathematical equations to a technical problem and come out with an answer but the engineer is the chap who has to build it and make it a reality. So this microphone was built in uh, and patented in 1931 and we made many hundreds of them and they were in use at Abbey Road Studios until the mid 50s. So you're saying that this mic uh, was one of the first at Abbey Road Studios? Yes. And Abbey Road was opened in what year? 1931 with these microphones? Not quite. We had, um, because the electrical age was fairly new, we hadn't got a studio, so we didn't have a research and development department. So we, when EMI was formed in 1931, it was the biggest company that joined us, HMV and Columbia, the Colombian uh, company had an engineer called Alan Blumlein. So now he was on our side. We said the first job he's got to do is design a cutting machine for cutting discs, 78 RPM discs, a new microphone and um, amplifiers to match. Because at that moment, 1931, we were hiring equipment from America such as the Western Electric Company. Mm -hmm. And uh, we weren't buying the equipment, we were paying them a royalty. For every record we sold, they got about one cent. And we were selling millions wow. of records a year. So Alan's job was very, very important mm -hmm. to design, particularly the cutting machine for cutting the discs. And that disc cutting uh, equipment he built went on for another 25, 30 years, the same equipment, Fantastic. cutting into wax. Wow. And I would like to talk also about this apparatus over here. Can you get it? So let's talk about this. It's an apparatus with a M49, and what is this mic this here? This is a KM56, which has got a uh, variable pattern. Mm -hmm. So it can be set uh, figure of eight or cardioid or omni. And this is the 
M49, which is a double diaphragm microphone. The power supply on the other end of the cable has got the pattern switch to make this Omni or uh, figure of eight. And they're both Neumann mics. They're both Neumann mics. They're both head to head. The idea for stereo recording, which is the uh, idea we made this frame, EMI made this frame to support them, was to get the capsules as close to each other as possible. And that's not always easy. So this was the nearest they could get like that without actually building something special, which hadn't ha happened. So you would have the KM56 in the uh, figure eight pattern and the M49 uh, with a cardioid pattern. And so you're making an MS uh, yes. recording. Yes. yes, I see. And these were, this was one way we were getting involved with stereo recording in the mid fifties. Mm -hmm. There were several um, experimental ways of pu putting microphones up for that purpose. This is just one example. It's fascinating. Does Abbey Road have any new mics and what does it take for a new mic manufacturer to m have one of their microphones make it into this collection? Well, new microphones um, are always being tried out. The trouble is we've got so many good microphones, it has to be really special if we want to go with something new. But microphones such as Sherps and DPA, which used to be B&K microphone build, were uh, extraordinarily good and suitable for recording in studios. Mm -hmm. um, they were very, they were slim line and quite Easy, easy to handle and to put up and phantom power and um, condenser as condenser microphones. We saw a, a microphone in the cabinet today made by uh, Sontronics. Yes. Would you say that this is a, a good good uh, addition to the Abbey Road collection? We, we do like Sontronics. Uh, they're good quality and we particularly like their stereo ribbon microphone. Mm -hmm. I think that was called the Apollo. Mm. And um, we hear they've got a new version, which I hope we can try out soon. But the, the stereo ribbon was, is liked by everybody, which is unusual. Everybody likes the same microphone. Mm. Does Abbey Road ever sell any mics? Oh, no. We never sell anything. In the early days, we had to build our own equipment. We built our own mixers, tape machines, and not so many mic. I've just shown the two microphones we did build, um, but never ever sell, never ever commercially. Well, Lester, it's been a pleasure. I think that you have probably the best job in the world. I think so. <laughs> Do you have any plans for retirement? Not soon? yet. No, no. Well, I hope it never comes. Ne I hope the day never comes for your retirement. Well, I'm happy and, here. Uh, very, very uh, glad to sit here and talk to you about Thank you very today. That was right. lovely. Yes. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and share it and subscribe to the Sound on Sound YouTube channel. Thanks for watching.